Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. Good morning. I think we should get started so we don't lose any more time. Um, on behalf of Ed Bacon, I'm happy to welcome you to the Rector's Forum. As I mentioned in church, Ed is preaching at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. this morning, which is a great honor for him and for us uh, at the invitation of our great friend Gary Hall. So it's been a really exciting morning for all, all of all saints nationwide. Um, I want to welcome those who are joining us via streaming. We're very glad you're with us this morning and that you get to experience this in your jammies. We're a little jealous of that. Um, our speaker, Andrew Mellon, lives by this motto, more love, less stuff. Uh, Ed met Andrew through his Oprah connection and has been talking up Andrew in his best-selling book, Unstuff Your Life, available over here, as if it was the fifth gospel. Uh, we all want cleaner closets and emptier desks, but this is actually serious business, the matter of deciding what you really want to spend your time on and with, deciding what is most important to you. And here's a hint, it might not be your stuff. Given our complicated relationships with the stuff in our lives, this can be daunting, but Andrew has a process that's clear and liberating and most importantly, fun. Andrew has been an actor, an award-winning playwright, a producer and director, and artistic director at theater companies in Seattle, Washington, D.C., and New York City. He's been all over the media from the Nate Berka Show to the Buddhist Review. In addition to leading workshops, he has a private consulting practice. He works with Fortune 500 companies, with nonprofits, authors, and filmmakers, and is working with our staff this week, which we're thrilled about, and overwhelmed parents. He's on the faculty at the New York Open Center in New York City. So let's get ready for some holy simplifying and help me to welcome Andrew Mellon. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Ready to get unstuffed? Awesome. I'm gonna, uh, can you hear me here? Great. That's great. Because I'm going to move around a little bit. This is a little confining for me. Um, so this feels a little Las Vegas, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with it. Uh, so, so here we are, and we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about more love and less stuff. We're going to talk about um, what I believe to be um, the right place for objects to live in our lives. And uh, I want to be clear that I am not an ascetic. I uh, I do not. Uh, while I am a practicing Buddhist, I don't just have a begging bowl and a pair of chopsticks and a robe. Um, <laughs> I live in a modest apartment in Manhattan, uh, and I do have things. Um, I'm not a minimalist, and so I'm not here advocating that people get rid of all of their worldly possessions. That's not what, that's not what unstuffing your life or living by more love, less stuff means to me. But what it does mean is that wherever the sweet spot in your life is, whatever is most important to you, if things, literally, physically, things are standing between you and what is... Uh, bringing you or promises to bring you sustainable joy in your life, whatever those obstacles are, if they are physical things, if they are emotional or psychological things, I, I, I have some ability to address that, but I'm really here talking about physical things. If those things are standing between you and what makes you happy, I'm going to encourage you to spend a, a few minutes looking at that and seeing what you can remove so that you can have clear access to the things that really bring you sustainable joy. Um, we have, a, we have a certain amount of time on the planet, um, regardless of what happens when we leave the planet. And uh, what we want to be about, what, what I believe we want to be about, is those moments of deep, abiding, sustainable joy. And if these things that are surrounding us are distracting us from that, then uh, they might not be in the right place, literally and figuratively. So there's a quote from uh, Dr. Herman Hesse that I like to start uh, talks with, which is, happiness is a how, not a what. Happiness is a how, not a what. You don't need to write this stuff down either. But, um, uh, and a lot of this stuff is available on my website. But for me, what that, what that says is that um, if we're looking for happiness, it's going to be how we're doing things, how we're participating in our own life. It's not the objects themselves that are surrounding us, which isn't to say that, you know, a new pair of shoes or a new car or um, 
a new jacket it can't bring us a, a moment of happiness. But again, if we're looking for sustainable joy, chances are, regardless of what kind of car it is, regardless of uh, whose name is on the shoes or the handbag, it's not going to keep us happy for long. So, um, and it's worth noting, I think, also that I don't do these workshops all over the world. There are some places where there isn't too much stuff. Uh, <laughs> And, and the point of that for me is that um, when we start to think about too much stuff and feeling overwhelmed by our responsibilities to these objects, um, there's, a few, there's two attitude adjustments that I think are key to softening our position and cracking things open so we can actually make some lasting change for ourselves. The first one is if we have a story that we tell ourselves about, like, why did this happen to me? You know, I'm a nice person. I basically pay my bills on time when I can find them. You know, I, I tell the truth. Uh, how did this happen? It, it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, we heard this morning that... Um, that why is a much more powerful question than, uh, than ho- that how is a much more powerful question than why. So I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to s- uh, reiterate that by encouraging all of us to, however we got to here, however we got the garage too full that we couldn't park a car in it, or our countertops full of things so we couldn't cook anymore, or the dining room table is littered with things and we can no longer have dinner there, or the coffee table or the pile of magazines or the closets are bursting with things, or we can't get into the attic or the basement or whatever it is, the the trunk of the car, it doesn't matter. How it got there doesn't matter. How we're going to move through it is where, is where the action is. That's what we want to be focusing on is how can, regardless of how it happened, how can we uh, drill down into it and make it go away quickly and sustainably, both sustainably so that we don't have to do it again and sustainably so that we don't trash the planet while we're doing it. As I said, I... I I do these workshops all over the country. I don't do them all over the world. I teach all over the world. I have students all over the world, but I don't, um, there are many places where I don't need to do these workshops. One of the key things about having too much stuff is acknowledging a, a sense of abundance in our lives. Even if we have become overwhelmed by the number of things that are surrounding us, by the piles of things, it's worth noting that what we have is a problem of too much, of abundance. And that's not, um, I, it's not a, a sense of um, sort of new agey abundance. It's literal abundance, and, and no, no uh, negative spin on New Agey abundance. That, that's, I'm, I'm fine with that. But my point is literally, if you have too much stuff, you want to acknowledge, wow, of all the things that I could be struggling with, abundance is my problem. It served me at one point because I brought all these things into my life, one by one. One by one, it didn't seem like too much stuff, but eventually it became too much stuff. So... The point for, for me around that is a sense of gratitude and appreciation that at one point I wanted all of these things. Now I don't. They don't serve me any longer. But I, the story that I'm telling myself about how they got into my life, the money I spent for the, the good money that I spent for them, it was good money. Well, everybody spent good money except perhaps maybe drug dealers and crime lords. It, it's all good money. So we're never going to be able to get the good money back out of it. If, that's, if we're waiting for the math to, to, to make sense, it's never going to happen. We, we spent it, and let's hope we've enjoyed it, or if it still has the tags on it, that somebody else will enjoy it when we take it to the consignment shop. The key is shifting our attitude from have to to get to. I get to let this stuff go. What a privilege that I have all of this stuff and I get to let it go because it doesn't serve me any longer. The, the, the shift in our attitude when it comes to that, it's surprising. I, don't, I can't completely understand it, but I can tell you that it's, I, I've been doing this work for 17 years. I have clients all over the country. I've watched this happen over and over again. 
it cracks open our heart just enough to let stuff leave. What we, what we previously were bound to suddenly starts to, starts, where it lives in our life starts to shift when we can say, thank you, thank you. I wanted you at one point and I don't any longer and I'm going to release you and give you away and I'm done with you. Thank you very much for being here. It's a remarkable shift that happens and it is, uh, it's kind of subtle and uh, surprising but meaningful. Uh, when we look at the stuff that surrounds us, and I'm just mindful of the time because I want to give you chances to answer, a- ask me questions. The way that I determine what stays in my life is I look at comfort, convenience, and beauty. Do these things bring me comfort? Do they make my life more convenient? Do they make my life more beautiful? If the answer is no to any of those questions, chances are this stuff can leave. So, you know copies of Oprah magazine from two years ago that you think you're going to go back to because there was one really good recipe, <laughs> chances are you can find that recipe online. And, you know, I, I don't want you to stop buying the magazine, but you don't necessarily need to hold on to the magazines unless you're a librarian. <laughs> and I want to also encourage you to really look at do you want to feel better or do you want to be better? Because there's a big difference between the two of them. And again, I would encourage you, if you want to just feel better, you should probably go to a physician or um, a a psychologist because they will help you with your feelings. They are not going to come to your home and clear off your your kitchen counter. They will clear off your, perhaps your mental counter, but they will not, or your emotional counter, but they will not take care of your kitchen counter or your dining room table. You can do that. And it really, it's, um, it is... Perhaps not easy, but it is really simple. So here, I'm going to ask everybody to do this for me. This is the organizational triangle. It's that simple. You you now have the technology in your hand. One home for everything. Like with like. Something in, something out. That's it. Everything else is uh, an elaboration of that process. But this, the organizational triangle, one home for everything, like with like, and something in, something out is all you need to know to get organized and to stay organized. And when we talk about getting organized and staying organized, it is essential that you understand that they are related, but they are not the same thing. So if you can imagine, getting organized is about this here, all of this accumulated stuff, whatever it is, again, books, papers, clothes, shoes, it doesn't matter, okay? Everything up until this moment, we're all here together. Accumulation. Right now, right here, right now, we're all together. This is the rest of your life, the future. Staying organized happens over here. So you apply the organizational triangle. We don't make more clutter. We don't make more mess. Awesome. It doesn't make this go away, sadly. (laughs) It doesn't make more of it, but it doesn't make this go away. So I like to say that it gets bigger before it gets better. Because when you start to crack this open, regardless of what these piles are, however overwhelming the garage looks when it's a clump, when you start to break it apart, it is mind-blowing that that clump morphed geometrically. (laughs) You will be surprised. Uh, And so I want you to just remember this conversation that you shouldn't be surprised because I promised you that it would happen. It will. I've never not seen a pile get bigger before it gets better, sadly. Um, so what I, the two tools that you want to use when it comes to getting organized are a timer and a camera. The camera is to take before pictures because your feelings will tell you as it gets bigger that this is a bigger mess than you ever imagined possible, that you will never affect change, that this will never go away. Now be mindful when you start to speak in nevers and always, chances are you're not telling the truth because few things are never or always. Most things are most, some, uh, seldom, occasionally. Few things are never and always. But your feelings will feel like, oh my God, this is impossible. I will never be able to make this go away. You will. And the camera is there to document it so that you can see, okay, I'm feeling like I just spent three hours in the garage and nothing is any different. But I can look at the pictures and see actually things are different. This isn't exactly the way it looked before. Something is happening. The timer you're going to use because you're going to work for no less than 15 minutes at a time. 
and no more than three hours in one sitting. You can set the timer. You can go, go for a walk, check your email, get a snack. And then you can come back and set the timer for another three hours. So it, it, it doesn't mean three hours in a day. You could work longer if you wanted to. But what you need to know about this stuff is that this stuff is inanimate. So it's not moving without your help. <laughs> and it will, it will sit still a lot longer than you will be able to exert your energy towards moving it. So if you, if you are stealing yourself for some sort of battle with it, thinking, I'm just going to work until I'm done, you will be done and it will be stationary. <laughs> so it's much better to quantify the task with the timer rather than setting yourself up thinking, I'm just going to not stop until I'm finished because you will be finished, you won't be finished. The timer is what's going to quantify it for you. So the, the, the timer and the camera are the two tools that you're going to use when it comes to getting organized. Staying organized, again, is all about the organizational triangle. It's assigning one home for everything, and one home means one home. The home for the keys is not just a general toss on your kitchen counter. That's not a home. That's a toss. A home is a vessel, a hook, a container, something that's going to actually containerize those keys so that when you want to find your keys, you only have to go one place to find them. They're either in their home or you're using them to unlock something. This principle we're going to apply to everything, not three quarters of the things that you own and then you're going to have some sort of general junk drawer in the kitchen for everything that you didn't want to make a decision about or a junk closet, or a junk room, or three storage bins off-site that you're paying hundreds of dollars every month for to keep old toasters and ratty furniture in. <laughs> because you're not going to have a toast emergency and need to go get that toaster and bring it home. <laughs> so one home for everything, like with like, means all like objects live together. Again, not most things. We don't have all of the tools in the toolbox except for the screwdriver and the hammer, which we keep, again, in the junk drawer in the kitchen. So that when you go looking for the hammer and you go to the toolbox and you think, I know that I have a hammer. Why is it not here with all of the wrenches and the pliers and everything else? Who had the hammer last? What was, I, was I hanging something up upstairs? What was I doing with that hammer? All of that wasted time you can't get back, and you will tell yourself, oh, it's just five minutes here or there. What's the big deal? But I will tell you that the average human being will waste one year of their lives looking for misplaced things. <laughs> so sit with that for a minute. A year of your life. Would you give up a year of your life to find the hammer? Your car keys, your cell phone, what would you give up a, life, a year of your life to access? Probably nothing that was a thing. So don't rob yourself of those five or ten minutes here or there and think that that's negligible, that you can just blow it off. It, it has no impact on your life. Because in the moment, it might not. But when you add it all up, it has a huge impact. And I'd certainly rather spend my time doing something more important than looking for my mobile phone. So one home for everything, like with like. Something in, something out is all about achieving stuff equilibrium. And for me, that means having enough of everything that serves you and nothing that doesn't. And again, I don't have an agenda around what that looks like. So if you live in a 5,000 square foot house and you have a 1,000 square foot walk-in closet, have a lot of shoes. It doesn't matter. There are no rules that say every adult person can only have nine pairs of shoes or three coats or four scarves. Or... There are no rules about that. The space will determine whether you have enough room for what you own. And if you can't walk into a closet or into a room because there's too much stuff in there, then there's too much stuff. And you can, I mean, I have counseled artists to turn their living rooms into studios so that they don't need to have a, a formal living room with a sofa and two easy chairs and a coffee table if that doesn't serve them. They can take their friends out to dinner once a month and, and have a, you know, take a room out in a restaurant. And that's a much that's a much better way to live their values than maintaining a living room that nobody sits in and not have a place to paint. 
Everything comes back to your core values. And in my book on Stuff Your Life, uh, on my website at andrewmellon.com, and, and scattered around the, the World Wide Web everywhere, you can find a series of core value exercises. It's essential that you know what is important to you. Because there's a huge difference between what is urgent and what is important. But if you don't know what's important, it's very easy to get distracted by urgency. Urgency, the way that I like to think about it is urgency is typically somebody else's agenda and important is our agenda. But again, if we don't know what's important to us, when your neighbor shows up to borrow a cup of sugar, if you don't know where the sugar is and you're on your way to the airport to pick somebody up, you're going to be late because you want to be a nice person and help out your neighbor. And you think that, well, my friend will just wait 15 minutes at baggage claim for me because I'm being a nice person. So that's an excusable delay. But your friend experiences you as always being late. Now, that's, that's some place that probably always actually is accurate. <laughs> so you want to be mindful of robbing yourself of those moments because you are easily distracted by something noisy in front of you. If you knew where the sugar was, you could direct somebody into your kitchen and say, in the baking section, you'll find all of the sugars that you're looking for. Here's the key to my house. Just lock it when you, when you are finished. I've got to run to the airport. So, you know, help yourself. You know exactly where everything is. It's easy to find. Let yourself out. That way, you are still available to be friendly and supportive of your friend who's baking. And at the same time, you can stay on mark and get to where you're supposed to be on time. So when we achieve stuff equilibrium, when we have enough of everything that serves us and nothing that doesn't, at that point, we're not in the process of augmenting anymore. We're not collecting. We're replacing. Even if you're upgrading, which is fine. Again, I, I don't, you know, you want a new computer, get a new computer, but it doesn't mean that you're going to keep the old computer in the closet again just in case. Or I'm going to remove all the data off of that someday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I, there is no sum in there. There is no sum day. <laughs> now, there are two kinds of laters. There's later, I'll meet you Thursday at 4 p.m. Then there's the later, it's not now, and I don't want to determine when it will be. I just don't want to do it now, so I will do it later. And that's just some, that's just like a stepchild of someday. It's, it's a vagueness that does not serve you in any way. Stuff equilibrium is where we want to get to. Enough of everything that serves us and nothing that doesn't. So that when we bring things in, it's because something is on its way out. And again, if you have 150 pairs of shoes, when you buy the 151st pair, it's because one of the first 150 is leaving. That's, it's that simple, and you made that up. I didn't. I'm not imposing that on you. That's how big your closet was. The, there's just two things I want to share with you, and then I'm going to open this up for questions. The last two things are that every task has a beginning and an end. Every task has a beginning and an end. So again, when we look back to getting organized and quantifying it with the timer, because again, if the task is I want to clean out my garage, but you can't do that in one sitting, you won't be able to actually finish the task. So if you imagine um, doing the laundry, the end of doing the laundry is not a basket of clean clothes on your bedroom floor. It's when the clothes are put away and the laundry basket is back on the dryer ready for more clean clothes. That's the full arc. So if you have a story where you, are, you, you tell people or you, have, you tell yourself, you know, I start a million things, but I don't ever seem to finish anything, that's because in your mind's eye, you see the end of the task, but you're actually not doing the end of the task because you're telling yourself, oh, I'll do that later. I mean, that'll take me 15 minutes. I can knock that out in no time. Well, when will you get those 15 minutes? You are not going to get them because when that later arrives, it's got its own agenda with its own demands on your time. You're not going to find those 15 minutes. You're going to have to steal them again from the future, and you're going you're to just time debt all the way to the end of your life. And I promise you, when you are in a hospital bed on life support, you will not be putting away the laundry. The last thing I want to share with you is that when everything is precious, nothing is precious. So when everything's precious, you're probably in a museum. And when nothing is precious, you're probably in a dump. Chances are you don't live in either of those places. Being able to, again, know what is important to you will help you to determine what actually is precious and what isn't precious. 
Because, I mean, here you live in California, there's bad weather, there's, uh, you know, there's mudslides, there's, all, there's fires, there's all kinds of stuff. If, God forbid, something is happening at your home and you have 30 seconds to make a decision and you want to grab something that's precious, I want you to know where that is. So if that's a companion animal, if that's an infirm parent, if that's a child... You want to know where they are and be able to get to them. If it's your grandmother's silver or a photo album, that shouldn't be buried under a bunch of old blankets in the last linen closet on the top floor someplace far away. You hope. You want to know where it is so you can get it because in those 30 seconds, I don't want you to have a bunch of regrets as you're running out of the house. So when everything is precious, nothing's precious, Every task has a beginning and an end. And there's so much more that I could share with you, but I really want to hear from all of you. So I'm going to open it up to some questions now. Do we have a volunteer to do the microphone? Somebody, will you do it, Frank? Great. I'll tell you what, let me... We'll have two, we can have two microphones. Okay, let's do two. Awesome. Thanks. And I'll stand still for this. Okay. (laughs) Okay, right here we have a question. And anybody on this side? I, I think it's really hard to find that equilibrium moment. Um, because culturally, the modern condition kind of says if something is good, more is better. If some uh-huh. French fries are good, more French fries are better. If some organization is good, then we should, you know, compartmentalize every screw. So how do you, you know, can you speak to the kind of self-fulfillment of finding that equilibrium? You know, the point? Well, let's talk about you specifically, because, I mean, this is... <laughs> she, she said I had to come to this. Yeah. This was like my fault. <laughs> When it comes to getting organized, these three principles, the organizational triangle, are universal. But there are no hypotheticals in, in organization. You have, your own, you, you have your own particulars. So there is no rule. So tell me what's going on with you. Uh, I'm the organizer. Sometimes it feels like the rest of the family are the mess or uppers. Uh-huh. So that's a story. Because, I mean, if you're in a stuff, if, if you're in a stuff um, discordant relationship, you still want to be able to share the space harmoniously, right? Yeah. So it, it ceases to be, and is this your... Is this this your, is my wife, Kathy. Okay. So, <laughs> great. She's not one of the chief mess reppers. They tend to be a little bit shorter. Sure. <laughs> what I'm going to suggest, certainly between the two of you, I mean, you can sit down and, and instead of it being, instead of the story of, I'm neat, they are not. There's not a lot of movement there. If, if the conversation is, we all share this house, and it's not functioning well, it doesn't serve any of us, because we, none of us can find anything. I'm upset, you're upset because you can't find things, but then when you do find them, you're done being upset, I'm still upset. So we're not living harmoniously together. We need, we need a common solution where I feel safe and secure in my house and you feel safe and secure in, in your house as well. So where's that common solution that serves both of us as opposed to behave the way I want you to behave, get into compliance with my rules? Because that's just going to create a lot of tension. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Can I just make a quick Please. announcement? Yep. I'm sorry. Um, there's no cause for alarm, but I want everyone to stay in this room uh, until we give the clear, there's apparently something going on in the church, and the police uh, department is here. Pardon me? We're clear now. Oh, we're clear now. Okay, thank you. No, no need for alarm. <laughs> we're going to stay until you're all organized. <laughs> Please. So um, once you're organized, once you've reached this nirvana state of organization, <laughs> I mean, how do you, uh, the, the two related questions here, how do you keep it going six months later, one year later, two years later, where you're just as organized as you were two years before? And then secondly, doesn't this somewhat relate to space filling? I mean, people acquire things to fill gaps in their life often, and I plead guilty to that as well. You know, I'll go shopping for a sports coat or for a shirt to do that. So isn't it also a process of, you know, filling that gap with something else to do this long term? Yes, of course it is. Thank you. Thank you. That is, when we talk about, when I talk about the sweet spot in your life, when I talk about more love, that, in... In this ideal world, which I don't think is an ideal world far away and unattainable to us, what is it that makes you happy? What would you prefer to spend your time doing? Oh, my family makes me happy. Okay, but... Okay. So if you could have more time to spend with your family rather than accumulating things, would you choose it in, an, in a vacuum if you were presented with more time with my family or more time at Nordstrom Rack? More time with my uh, family. <laughs> 
Right. So if, if, you are, if that is one of your core values, is spending time with your family, then when you, when you are presented with this absence of things to do because you are organized and this is done, you're just going to fill that up with more time with your family. So if there's other activities that you could be doing because instead of shopping or instead of rearranging things, trying to get order into your life, all of that free time is available for what feeds your spirit. So again, whether that's spending time with your family, whether that's cooking, uh, baking cookies for the church bazaar, whether it's dealing with climate change, whatever it is, where, whatever it is that makes you happy that you're not able to do as much of as you would like to, that's what you will be doing instead of rearranging things. Well, of course. I mean, that's, yes. I mean, the whole point is about experiences. So, I mean, I'm a big one when it comes to gift giving to give people experiences as opposed to trying to shop for them, which, again, I'm not, I don't want to dismantle capitalism this morning, but I want to be clear that when it comes to gift giving, you know, how many times do we give people gifts that we want them to have? I really want you to have this. I don't, I don't know that you want it, but I really want you to have it. And... Um, yeah, yeah, I just want to wrap this up with, 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 I just want to tie this up for you is that the idea is certainly the experiences is where we're headed. We want more experiences, whatever those experiences are, rather than more time spent with objects. The, the objects are, they're, again, they are inanimate. They will not reciprocate our affection for them. But people can, you know, people and, and uh, organizations can. Yes, please. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> my mother passed away. And she always told me that this stuff, letters, photos, all this stuff was family. It's all important. I move all of her stuff to my garage. I've got mm-hmm. boxes of it there. And I go out there and I thumb through it and I can't figure it out. It's been 10 years now. I can't <laughs> figure out how to go through this and sort this stuff around. But I, you know, is there a way to approach sentimental type stuff? Yes, there is a way to improve. And I'm sorry about your mom's loss, uh, the loss of your mom. Uh, I will point, your, point everybody's attention to, th- to these, your guilt-free certificates that you can take home and fill out. There's no reason for you to hold on to anything that doesn't mean something to you. And, and I'm not saying that, that that's the case with your mom's stuff. But if you come across old photographs and you don't know who anybody is in those photographs and your mom's not here to identify them, you don't need to keep them just because there's a rumor or a story that you were somehow related to these people that you don't know. That, that has no meaning. If there's love letters between your mom and your dad and those are meaningful to you, then by all means keep them and figure out some way to store them so that they don't disintegrate in your damp garage. If... If they're just, you know, birthday cards that she got that somebody scribbled in it, happy birthday, Sally, and we don't know who wrote it, and she saved it just because that was the thing to do, there's no, that, that has no meaning. I, I mean, it, it barely had any meaning to her. That card was, was there to convey a, a momentary wish of something. But to, to endow it with deep meaning as if happy birthday, Sally, translates across generations... You know, it was a $4 card from Hallmark, which is different than a a letter that perhaps your dad wrote to her during a war and said, you know, I can't wait to see you again, and I'm on my way back to you, and, you know, keep the faith, I'm coming. That might, you know, every time you look at that, that might remind you of your parents and the love that they had for each other and a whole different relationship. So, again, when everything's precious, nothing's precious. We want to be able to tell the difference between the things that are precious and then you know, the ball of aluminum foil that my grandmother used to keep under the, under the kitchen cupboard. That was because she survived a depression and was terrified of never having aluminum foil. It was not a sentimental object. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, you're welcome. Please. Yes. Um, thank you so much. This is very helpful. I recently moved from a house to an apartment and things are very cluttered. What to do about that counter you described, which is full of magazines I haven't read. (laughs) So when it comes to magazines, three back issues are all you're allowed. Yeah. Unless, again, you're taking a very long plane trip to, like, Australia, where you're going to be wanting to read more than three magazines... 
there will be another one coming in three weeks. So you can let the old ones fall off. All of this stuff is available online. And the idea, or at the library, I'm a big advocate for using the libraries. If you don't have room to store all of these things, the illusion that when you have all of this free time, you're going to go rifling back through old copies of Martha Stewart Living to figure out how to press your antique linens and keep them from yellowing. You can find that information in five minutes on Google. So by the time you remember that it was the September 2011 issue to go find it, you, they'll be yellower. So three back issues, that's it. Yes, please. Yeah, um, uh, right here. Yes. I, I'm just curious, uh, since you've studied this, I guess. Uh, I, I just made it all up. <laughs> How much of this is learned versus how much is simply innate? In other words, be, being able to be organized or not. Um, I will say that I, and my mother is here in the audience um, with us, uh, my mother will attest to the fact that I was not an organized child. I was organized about the things that mattered to me, so my chemistry set was always really neat because I enjoyed playing with that. And my matchbox cars were all lined up according to the organizational triangle. I had all of my uh, emergency vehicles were in one section. All of the cars with operational windows and doors were in one place. Um, all, of the, uh, all of the dump trucks and things were in one. So, so some of this stuff made sense to me because it made interacting with my match and my, my baseball card collection as well was really well organized because those were the things that I used and uh, interacting with them effectively and efficiently mattered to me. So I, I don't think that anyone is born organized any more than I think anyone is born disorganized and I think that regardless of whether you have OCD or ADHD or any of those kinds of diagnoses, there are plenty of people that are tremendously high functioning who have disabilities and it's not a good enough explanation because you are easily distractible that you can't put things back in their home. If you can't remember where the keys go, then you, you can leave yourself notes and maps around the house like the keys live here. <laughs> and I'm serious. I mean, there's no reason you, your high functioning is more important than your vanity. So if it serves you to have a note on the back door that says, check the stove to make sure the burners are off, and do you have your car keys and your cell phone, then that will help you. There's no reason to not be able to find the things that matter to you easily and quickly. And the beautiful thing about One Home for Everything and Like with Like means that you'll be able to get your hands on anything in 30 seconds or less. I mean, it, it, all of that time will be freed up for you. Does that... Okay. Please. Hi. Um, I have a question about um, what to do after you're gone. My wife and I had the dreaded meeting with our kids about, here's our house. It's full of things that we love. What do you want? And the answer was none, nothing. <laughs> they have different, completely different lifestyles than we do and, and all that. But this is very um, precious to us. Some of it's valuable, some not. And I say, well, just sell it. They said, we don't want to be bothered with that. So what do you do <laughs> to... I mean, how do you just you hire somebody to sell your stuff? I mean, you, you can or? certainly make those arrangements ahead of time to have an estate person come in and clear it all out, and then they'll, I guess, they'll just get the check. Uh, they won't do any of the labor. They'll just get the check when it's all done, right. minus whatever it costs to liquidate everything. I mean, if there's certain things that you're holding on to now in the hopes of liquidating them, be clear that it takes two people for something to have value. You as the person who has it, and the other person that's going to give you some money for it. So if you have things that you believe are valuable, like a Beanie Baby collection, or a bunch of National Geographics, or you actually have a Picasso, I mean, you want to make sure that you can find the other person to enter into that transaction with you, because otherwise you just have a lot of stuffed animals. You don't necessarily have a collection of anything that's going to make your retirement easier to send somebody through college. So in your case, I would suggest that you, you be as proactive as you can be to make arrangements for the things that do have high value to be either liquidated upon your 
non-use of them, whether that means leaving the planet or, um, you know, moving to someplace smaller where you can't take them. And then everything else, I would, I would make some sort of arrangements with an estate planner now so that all of that can go into, into action as soon as you're gone and your kids don't need to, in, in, to interact with it. Thank you. Right yep. There. Okay. Here. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I wanted to pass along two tips from my grown granddaughter. We went down to my mother and dad's house to clean it out after they died. She went with me, and she would hold something up and she'd say, "Do you girl? Do you guys remember this? You know, with my son?" We'd say, "Oh yeah, we did." She'd say, "Good," and she'd throw it away. <laughs> And then she told my daughter, she said, take all your chotskis, the little vases, the little thing, put them on the dining room table, they're all used, and you go through each one of them and say, would I buy this? And if you wouldn't, it's gone. But if you would, it's not. Now, our house burned down. I had the humiliation of everything in our house either burning up or putting out on the front lawn for all the neighbors to come and see how much junk I had. And that's a real humiliation. You don't want to be humiliated that way. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much. Join me in thanking Andrew and check out his website and buy his book.